everyone. Welcome to worship today. A uh, few quick reminders. So one, we didn't receive any prayer requests this week. So if you would like your prayer request prayed for on here next week, then please email those to me. Or if you have any prayer requests for our prayer team, you can also send those to me or any member of the prayer team. Uh, number two, you can see we have communion set up here. Uh, Miss Mary Martin set it up for us. And well, we're going to do that in person here, but if anybody wants to do it but is not going to be here, then please contact me and we can set something up. Uh, and number three, oh, number three, uh, I'm going to try to do a book study or two soon if there's anyone interested. So if you are interested, please contact me and we can talk about uh, what you want to study. So that's all. If you would, please join me now. Uh, in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
Amen. anyone here ever seen the movie Shawshank Redemption? Well, there's one scene in the movie where the main character, Andy Dufresne, uh, who's spent the past six years in prison writing letters uh, 
to try to get books for the prison's library. And so after six years, he finally receives a donation of used books and then other sundries. And as he's sorting through it in the warden's office, he's left alone for a moment. And then he stumbles upon a record, uh, like a musical record player type record. And so he locks the doors, he tosses on the record, and then he starts playing it over the loudspeakers for the whole prison to hear. And then his friend Ellis, he's out in the yard listening, uh, and he does a voiceover, it's Morgan Freeman, and he says, for the briefest of moments, every last man in Shawshank felt free. But it made the warden, the warden very upset. Uh, so he, he comes up and he starts rattling the doorknob, and he's like, open the door! And then more rattling, even louder. Open the door! Bang in! Dufresne, open this door! Turn that off! And Andy, he leans over the record player. He gives the warden a look. The warden says, I'm warning you, Dufresne, turn that off! Well, Dufresne, he's still leaning over the record player. He turns it up loud. Stares at the warden and he gives him a grin. Well, the warden now, he steps aside and gives the order to a guard. So the guard comes up and he says, Defray! He knocks with his baton. You're mine now. And then he breaks the glass and he busts in and takes him down and he stops the music. And Morgan Freeman, he gives another voiceover. And he got two weeks in the hole for that little stuff. So Andy, he chose not to obey the warden. Should he have? Should he have obeyed? What reasons did Andy have to obey? What reasons did the warden give him? Maybe to avoid punishment. Or maybe he should have obeyed to avoid a beating. To avoid being put in the hole in isolation. But what about us? What reasons do we have to obey God? How would you answer? Take a moment, think about it. And maybe we'd answer the same as Andy. Uh, we might say we should obey to avoid punishment, to avoid a beating. Uh, or maybe we, we would say, uh, instead of the stick, we'd get the carrot, we'd say, well, we should obey to receive the reward. Or maybe we should just obey because the Bible says to. Now, there's many answers, many reasons to obey, and not all of them are correct, but the Bible tells us of multiple reasons. But today, we're not going to look at all those other reasons. We're just going to look for the answer in our text, in what we've been reading. So let's dive in. First up, we're going to read from Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. This is right after the temptation. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And now we're going to jump back to before the baptism. We're going to read Matthew 3, verses 1 through 3. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So, did you notice anything? 
So John and John the Baptist and Jesus, they both say the same thing. They say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Right? So, so on this side, before it all, John says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then we move over to this side after it all, and Jesus says the same thing. And this, this is called an inclusio. An inclusio is the repetition of words or phrases or even ideas at the beginning and end of a unit, creating a bracket effect. And then at the boundaries, the brackets, it establishes the main concern of that unit or that section. So our bracket is talking about the kingdom of heaven. And this phrase, kingdom of heaven, we only see it in the Gospel of Matthew because the other three Gospel writers, they're using a different phrase. They're saying the kingdom of God. Uh, why is this? Is Matthew talking about something different? No, he's talking about the same thing. Uh, but Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience, and uh, Jews typically avoided saying God's holy name. And so Matthew seems to be using heaven here as a way of being of showing reverence to God's name. So John and Jesus are talking about the kingdom of God. Now, kingdom, by kingdom, they mean the realm in which a king sovereignly rules. Not a specific place, uh, but just wherever God rules. So a question. Does God rule in the United States of America? We would, we would say in general, no, uh, but on a closer inspection, we, we might say, oh, well, well, parts of it, uh, God rules in the lives of those who choose to live under his reign. Uh, so we could ask the same about other countries. Does, does God rule in China? Uh, does God rule in South Africa uh, or even in larger areas? Does God rule in the Middle East? And same with America, uh, we would say no, but, but at the same time, God rules in parts of them. So, our brackets are primarily concerned with the reign of God, with the rule of Christ in believers' hearts and lives. But there's more to the statement. Uh, the kingdom of God has come near. Uh, the kingdom of God, it has drawn near. It is near. It is at hand. The kingdom of God is here, standing before us in King Jesus. King Jesus is here to bring his reign. And the statement starts out with the word repent. Uh, repent means to have a change of mind, to have a change of heart, to think differently. Uh, in this context, it means to have a change in regards to acceptance of God's will. So repent Turn from your way of thinking and doing and turn towards God's way of thinking and doing. And, and if you remember back to my first sermon in this series, repentance is exactly what Jesus' baptism was, was about. Uh, Jesus said, fulfill all righteousness. It's a weird phrase, but it told us that Jesus' baptism is an Essene baptism of repentance. And so through this baptism, obviously Jesus doesn't need to repent, but what he's saying is, watch me, I'll show you how to do it. I'll show you how to bring order out of chaos, how to bring kingdom and shalom, God's order and peace and wholeness, how to bring it to this world that it's meant for. But what does it really mean to bring the kingdom? Well, you might have noticed it before. But there's actually a second inclusio here. So, uh, we have John's statement, and then right after John's statement, Matthew says, This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And then, just before Jesus' statement, we have Matthew saying, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land at the shadow of death, a light has dawned. So, 
What do these two passages from the prophet Isaiah have in common? Well, the first one over here, uh, it is talking about comfort for God's people. And more specifically, it's trying to give hope to those who are in exile. Well, the second one is from Isaiah 9, and it's talking about hope for, for freedom from oppression. Uh, and it's found within the context of Isaiah's Emmanuel statements. Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, and so it, it's saying God has done this before. God has rescued his people from slavery and, and from exile. And now in the person of Jesus, God has come to do it again, but this time bigger. Now what we're talking about here is salvation. In the Bible, salvation is primarily about here and now. It's not about when we die. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is brought here to earth, not us to there. Uh, and eternal life is not just after we die. Actually, what the Bible primarily talks about with eternal life is it is a life. Uh, it is a, a quality of life that is available for us to experience today. And this is the primary narrative of Scripture. God's reign here and now. Let's read it in, in Genesis 1, the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So the world is in chaos. But then God is going to speak. So then we jump to the end. Uh, the end of chapter 1, and it says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. So, the world was chaos, but then God spoke and, and did all this stuff, and then at the end, the world is very good. And, and it's not saying, it's not perfect, creation isn't perfect, but it's good. Uh, it's filled with so much potential to be so much more, to be so much better. But who will bring about this goodness. And so God, he's going to want partners in this good creation project. And so he creates humans. He says, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. We are said to be in God's image. And I love how the Bible Project talks about this. They say, This means we are to represent God's reign on earth. So the story, it begins full of potential, and we humans, we have this amazingly elevated, royal, sacred task of embodying God's rule. But humans choose to ditch God and to find good and evil for ourselves. Humans, uh, we, we create our own alternate kingdom. And this culminates eventually in Egypt, and in Babylon, and Rome. And suddenly we have a clash of two kingdoms. And so God is constantly trying to invade our kingdom and save us from ourselves. But we are constantly wanting to push God out of the equation. So, how will God respond? Well, he starts out by choosing a family, Abraham and Sarah, and he liberates their descendants from slavery in Egypt, from a human kingdom, from the world of sin and death. The Exodus is a picture of salvation because God liberates his people out of that oppressive evil and leads them to a new freedom. And then God invites them to live under his reign. Now, unfortunately, Israel was unable to live up to the task of being the image of God. They were unable to reign on God's behalf on earth. And then Jesus shows up. Uh, and initially, he's just seen as a new prophet on the scene. Uh, and he's bringing this new message. He's talking about the kingdom coming in a new and a fresh way. Uh, he's sharing the good news. 
The good news is that the kingdom, or the reign of God, that it has arrived in Jesus. In the incarnation of Jesus, God binds himself so closely to humans. Uh, God becomes the truest expression of humans. God becomes the truest human ever. The one, the, the type of human that we're all created to be. The image of God. And then somehow, mysteriously, through Jesus and through following him, we become the humans that we were made to be. So, why should we obey? We should obey to, to bring the kingdom of heaven, God's reign, here. We should obey to be part of what God is doing in this world. Sometimes, too often, in my opinion, uh, we think of God as being very strict. And God's yelling at us. He's like, obey! Obey or else! Uh, and we think of God as a drill sergeant yelling at us when we step out of line. Uh, or maybe we think of God like a prison warden. He's banging on the glass. Uh, he's threatening us with a beating and time in the hole. And maybe God is like that at times. But way more often, I find God inviting us to obey. So, so we're all fighting to be our own line leader. We're all fighting to lead the way. But we don't know where we're going. We're all going different ways, and, and we're all going the wrong ways. And then Jesus shows up, and he says, follow me. I am the way, and the truth, and the life. And follow me is exactly what Jesus says next. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people at once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So God called twelve tribes of Israel, and now Jesus is calling twelve disciples. Well, let's keep going. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain and being possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed. So Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom of heaven is here, hop aboard. And what does kingdom look like? Well, people find healing, people find freedom from pain and disease and distress and from oppression, and large crowds are flocking to Jesus, flocking to Emmanuel, flocking to God with us. And what comes next is the Sermon on the Mount. And it's going to be a new Torah teaching from the mountain. It's going to be a new Moses giving instruction on how to bring kingdom. And it's going to be a new invitation from God. Live under my reign. So the Sermon, the sermon on the Mount, it's a summary of Jesus' upside down kingdom. And in it, Jesus will teach what it means to live under the rule and the reign of God. And the Sermon on the Mount is what we are moving on to next week. But before we get there, I need to prepare you. So, Jesus' message is very anti. It's anti-empire. It is anti-Egypt, anti-Babylon, anti-Rome. And we should be wondering... Is it anti-America? Are we an empire of today? Will Jesus' message challenge our culture and our nationalism and our lifestyles? 
So Jesus' message is also anti the religious elite. Uh, it is anti those who think that they get to determine and enforce the rules. Uh, it is anti those who think that they get to decide who is in and who is out. So what each of us should be wondering this week is this. What Jesus has to say is it good news to me. Shane Claiborne's book, Jesus for President, he writes, The prophets point us to what is ahead, the fulfillment of God's dream for creation. And they invite us not simply to wait, but to begin enacting that dream now. And we find ourselves today living within and inclusive. So, so Jesus came to bring his kingdom. And Jesus will come again to bring his, his kingdom to fulfillment. And in between, Jesus is inviting us. He's saying to each of us and to all of us, may you follow me. May you do what I do. May you join me in what I, God, am doing in this world and may you live under my reign and be part of my alternative 